All right, thanks for bearing with me there, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I had a uh, uh, brief bout with uh, Murphy's Law, um, but it looks like we got everything working now. So uh, thanks for attending the uh, SciSonic breakout session here at OCP. Uh, my name is Joe Levesque. I'm with the Sonic team at Microsoft, and uh, today I'm going to be presenting on um, platform management services within Sonic. And first, I'd like to begin with a little uh, a breakdown of terminology. Um, using the word platform. Platform is a kind of a generic term, so just kind of want to let you know what we're going to be speaking about today. Uh, so when defining platform here, uh, Sonic shares the, the definition of platform with ONI. Um, and uh, ONI defines uh, a unique platform um, as an entire collection, a unique entire collection of hardware that comprises a physical device. So um, that is to be um, differentiated from just the ASIC. Uh, we all know that the switching ASIC is the, the brains of the switch, and then the rest of the platform is built around that and supports that ASIC. So when we speak of a platform, we're speaking about the entire device with uh, the ASIC and all the peripheral uh, hardware built into it. So uh, in Sonic, the ASIC itself is abstracted and managed by Psi. Um, so when we're speaking of the platform here, we're speaking about all the peripheral platform hardware, SFP transceivers, etc. So this presentation is going to focus on how Sonic supports these peripheral devices. And to begin, we'll list off um, all of the uh, platform peripherals. As, as Jeff was talking about, Jeff from Big Switch uh, Networks earlier, uh, there's quite a few. We have power supply units. Every device has power supply units. Um, sometimes two, sometimes more. Fan modules, same thing. We have uh, varying, you know, modules, varying uh, quantities of modules. Every every platform is completely different. Uh, SFP transceivers. Again, we have multiple SFP cages on the front of the device. Uh, all the cabling connects to these, and there's multiple models. You know, we have uh, uh, SFP, SFP Plus, QSFP. We have uh, 40 gig, 100 gig. There's so many different types of hardware out there. So we need to uh, be able to um, interface with all of these uh, varying uh, pieces of hardware. Uh, front panel LEDs. We, uh, every platform has LEDs um, along with each of those cages to indicate status of each port. Um, environment sensors, um, as with any um, platform like this, we have temperature sensors and voltage sensors, fan speeds, multiple things to monitor there. Um, the system EEPROM, every, uh, every switch has a system EEPROM with uh, um, information burned into it. We need to access that. And then um, every platform has its own array of system status registers. So there's plenty of peripheral hardware here outside of the ASIC that we need to interface with. And what do we need to do with this hardware? Two things. We need to read data from it to obtain the states of each of these devices. And then we also need to be able to write to some of these devices to modify their state. Looks easy, right? It's two things, two steps. But it's not. We have all these different devices. So for power supply units, we need to read um, how many PSU slots we have on the device. Again, that varies between platform. Uh, PSU presence, we need to know whether or not the PSU itself is present in each of the slots that's available on the device. Um, PSU operational status, which takes into account the presence, of course, but it takes into account other factors, and that varies by platform and, and, um, and by power supply itself, what qualifies a PSU as being functional, operational. Um, a PSU fan direction, each PSU has a fan to cool itself down, we need to make sure we have the, the fan direction. Is, is, the, is it an intake fan or exhaust fan? Um, do we know what we intend it to be? And does that match? Uh, PSU fan speed, of course, same thing. We need to make sure that this, is, this fan is operating as we expect it to and keeping that power supply cool. And in order to do that, we also need to access the temperature sensors inside the power supply. So all of that is just data we need to read from this one power supply unit. Um, and then we would need to write to the power supply um, in order to control the PSU status LED. We need to indicate to the network engineers in your data center 
that this uh, visually that they can tell you know that this power supply is functional or it's not working properly. And we also need to be able to access um, the PSU fan speed. We need to be able to adjust that fan speed. And that's just with a power supply unit. We have fan modules. Again, we need to access, we need to know how many fan modules um, are present or should be present on this device. Um, we need to be able to determine whether or not they're present. We need to, again, control the fan direction, the fan speed. We need to be able to check and compare the, the speed and the direction with the expected fan speed and a tolerance level there, and also the expected fan direction. Uh, we need to be able to get um, fan module EEPROM data. Again, each fan has a serial number, a model number um, burned into it. We need to be able to access that data. And we need to actually listen for fan interrupt events. Um, the same with the PSU as well. If a PSU is removed, inserted, if a fan module is removed, inserted, we need to have that information available to us at the uh, operating system, uh, the user level of the operating system so that we can um, make changes accordingly. And again, we need to write to the device because we need to adjust the fan speed. And we need to write to the fan module LED to again um, indicate to the data center uh, network engineers the status of that fan module. Um, SFP transceivers, much of the same applies. We need to know uh, whether or not the, the module is plugged in, whether it's present or not. Um, we need to be able to get data off of that transceiver's EEPROM, um, model number, uh, serial number, and then we can also read um, optical monitoring data. We can get the uh, actual signal levels, RX and TX levels off of that device. We can check the temperature and voltage of that um, specific module. And um, <clears throat> most of these uh, SFP transceivers can be configured to be in low power mode or not. So if you, um, if you have a shorter cable, um, you don't need to uh, waste extra uh, efficiency by um, blasting a high uh, laser level. So you can um, put the device into low power mode. We need to be able to query that. We also need to be able to set that. And then uh, again, like with the other devices, we need to be able to um, intercept interrupt events so that we know if an SFP module has been removed or plugged in. From panel LEDs, we need to be able to write to these devices. We need to, be able to change their states, um, turn the LEDs on and off depending on status of, the, of, uh, of in the case of uh, SFP transceivers, with each lane, with each port, with each lane, we can configure uh, um, patterns in Sonic. Uh, we define patterns and or color schemes um, to indicate the status of each port. Uh, whether or not there's a breakout, we can uh, define different patterns that's being discussed within the community now to standardize um, color schemes and patterns for what a, so a sonic device looks like when you examine the LEDs on the front panel. Um, and then there are other um, general front panel status LEDs, and these vary from platform to platform. Some manufacturers have all of the above, some have more, some have less, uh, but there's an overall status um, LED sometimes just a general status LED. There's fan status, which gives you an overall status of all the fans. So if any of the fans are malfunctioning, then the front panel LED also will indicate that something's wrong, which will send the network engineer to the back of the switch to find which one is bad. <clears throat> Same with PSUs, et cetera. So this varies, again, widely, as Jeff was talking about earlier, from device to device, from platform to platform. Um, everything's different. Environment sensors, temperature, voltage, fan speed, all these sensors exist in different quantities. Some, uh, some switches have more temperature sensors, some have less. Uh, it's really, it's a grab bag depending on which platform you're working with. Um, we uh, monitor these sensors uh, using the, um, the open source package LM sensors uh, that um, there's a daemon running there that monitors and then logs um, the status of the sensors to the syslog. Again, system EEPROM, we need to read the model number, the serial number, and a lot of times the base MAC address is stored on that EEPROM as well. We need to be able to access all of that information. And then system status registers, which vary again from platform to platform. If the platform is able to determine um, whether the previous reboot was caused by a power loss, um, some platforms, uh, many platforms store that information in a register and then upon the next reboot, you can access that information and see whether or not 
the device lost power previously or a thermal overload. Some, uh, some devices will keep track of that. Um, so again, some platforms have all, of, all of this information. Some have some, some have none. And uh, how, do we, how do we obtain all this information? How do we, uh, it's, it's a wild world out there, right? It's the wild west. So we need to tame this. We need to rein this in somehow. So we have some design principles here with Sonic. And um, it's based around the first main principle here where Sonic defines a unified standardized behavior. So what we want is we want a consistent experience among all Sonic devices, regardless of the underlying platform. We want the network engineers to be able to walk up to a device, and whether it's a, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter what, which platform you have in front of you, um, you have the same experience. LED patterns are, are similar. You're able to recognize what is, you know, what state each port is in, and, uh, and then not only does it make it easier in the field for someone troubleshooting these devices, it makes it easier to understand the code, implement the code, to test the code, and debug the code, because we know what we're expecting. It should be the same on every platform. So in order to implement unif unified standardized behavior, one of the first things um, we want to do is keep um, it, black box code is as small as possible, right? So we want the kernel modules, which are developed by the platform vendors, to be as simple and basic as possible, because that's code that isn't easily debugged and uh, differs from platform to platform. So we, uh, we ask the platform vendors, excuse me, to, uh, to keep the kernel modules as simple as possible. Basically just expose the hardware registers that are necessary for each of these operations that we discussed previously. The kernel modules themselves should have no control logic. There shouldn't be any deep logic in there whatsoever. It should just simply expose the modules um, outward and let Sonic take care of um, dealing with them. Right? So that's number three. The peripheral control logic itself will be implemented in user space. Um, so those are applications um, that are developed in the Sonic um, uh, I guess ecosphere, and they uh, are the same applications that run on every platform. So that way the behavior remains the same no matter the platform. It's just how they interact with the hardware themselves is defined by the vendor. So in between those two levels, we need a, a, an abstraction layer. So we've defined um, a standardized uh, set of APIs uh, that the vendors also need to implement. They create their kernel modules. So you just uh, expose your module, your um, hardware through your kernel modules, and then you, um, you implement these APIs, which then in turn access that hardware that you exposed. So yeah, this is a breakdown of what I was just describing. Kernel modules, just expose the peripheral hardware. Platform vendor writes these. Uh, Platform-specific plugins, which is a standardized API that the Sonic team and community has put together, and um, the vendor implements these. It's basically an abstract-based class for each of these, um, for each uh, platform component, and um, each of those APIs needs to be implemented in order to access the exposed hardware. Um, so the, this this allows freedom on, on the uh, on the vendor side because they can expose their hardware however they please whether it be through SysFS if they have an I squared C tree or um, however I, IPMI, if there's, if there's any way they need to expose them themselves, they can do that in their module and then they can link that uh, through the plugin. The plugin knows how to access the hardware and how it was exposed. And then the client applications at the Sonic level um, run as normal on every platform. They have no distinction of what platform they're running on they call functions from within the plugins, and the plugins access the hardware. So the applications run the same on every platform. And these client applications in Sonic um, fall into two categories. We have command line utilities, um, so like our SFP util. Um, that utility is simply meant to read and write to the uh, SFP transceivers. 
um, PSU util. I bet you can guess that reads and writes to PSUs, etc. So these command line utilities um, access or import our our, um, our Python APIs that I was describing earlier, the plugins, uh, and then those plugins deal with actually accessing that platform's hardware, whereas the command line utility just does the same operation on every platform. And for command line utilities, we we can query those read values, those registers I was speaking of earlier, and then we can write to um, the write registers and modify the actual state of the hardware. Um, and then daemons, we have two types of daemons here. These listed here are uh, um, sonic daemons, so LED daemon, the transceiver daemon, uh, PSU daemon, etc. cetera. Um, each of these daemons is a persistent application, of course, running in the background, and they interact with the hardware through the same plugins that the command line utilities use, and uh, they also uh, read and write to uh, the Sonic. Uh, we have a Redis database that's maintaining state of the device. So the daemons will interact by reading current state of the device and modifying the hardware appropriately, or vice versa, reading the state of the hardware and then writing to the database. So the daemons are a constant um, interaction between known state and actual state of the peripheral hardware. This is a little basic layout here of uh, top, uh, from bottom up of the hardware itself. And um, to access that hardware, again, the vendor will implement kernel modules. Uh, that layer is, you know, depending on how the vendor wants to implement that. Uh, the green layer above that is our Python plugins. So um, that's the set of APIs that needs to be implemented by the vendor as well. Um, and then on top of this, we have our clients. Uh, over here on the right first, you'll see that these daemons, uh, sensor D, which is part of LM sensors and fan control, uh, those two packages, um, they do not access our plugins. These are just open source packages that access directly to um, the hardware itself. Uh, but through our Python plugins are all the daemons and command line utilities on the left. Uh, those are all Sonic implemented um, uh, applications. And as you can see, the, uh, the daemons themselves interact with the Redis database. So all of this is a two-way uh, interaction, right? Read and write back and forth uh, between all these applications and the hardware. And I'd like to show you one example here of one of our clients. This is the transceiver daemon. Uh, this is a little flow chart. Hopefully you can read it here with these vertical uh, lines. It might make it a little messy. But um, as you can see, this is a time flow from top to bottom. And uh, over on the left, we have the Redis state database in Sonic. Uh, the second um, blue box at the top is the transceiver daemon itself. Uh, the third box is the SFP util plugin. And then uh, on the right is the driver, right? So, so the... Magic. Ooh. All right, so uh, the right two modules, of course, the, dry, the kernel module itself and the SAP util plugin are supplied by the, the, the module is supplied by the vendor and the plugin is implemented by the vendor. Um, so here, as you can see, following the transceiver daemon down in time, uh, the first step up there is a loop to wait for the port to be configured. Once the port is configured, the uh, daemon itself will access the SAP util plugin and request uh, the digital optical monitoring information right at the beginning of its uh, operation. The plugin, in turn, <clears throat> knows how to access that information from the driver because the plugin is implemented to access the, the however the hardware was uh, exposed. The driver returns the information to the plugin. The plugin returns the information to the daemon. The daemon spawns a new thread. Um, and the uh, so it has two threads running: the blue section and the and the yellow section here. In the blue section, in the blue section, I didn't even touch anything that time. In the blue section, as you can see, uh, this is done upon request. 
So, um, so when the uh, it, it'll um, monitor, get the SFP uh, and the digital optical monitoring information whenever on the left, as you can see, um, a uh, an SFP module is inserted or removed. So this is upon request. This thread handles requests as the the uh, modules are inserted, or removed, and then we have a separate thread down here on a timer that's constantly, no matter what the activity is is happening physically, um, it's constantly on uh, an interval accessing that same information and, and refreshing it in our database. So this keeps the Redis database, uh, the state database of the machine uh, up to date, making sure we know whether a module is inserted or removed currently and what the status of the actual optical levels are on that transceiver. That brings us to testing. So after all this is implemented, it needs to be tested. And uh, again, it's the Wild West. So there's so many different combinations of, of hardware out there. Uh, getting the, the testing to match the platform is, is difficult. So uh, we've divided the testing here. Um, of course, the, the platform vendor is implementing the kernel modules and implementing the plugins. So the testing uh, of those um, pieces of the puzzle here is left to the platform vendor because A, they know, you know, the vendor themselves know this hardware and how it behaves better than the Sonic community, right? They, they work directly with that, that platform. Um, and B, it's, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we can't have, you know, physical, not everyone in the Sonic community can have a physical copy of each device in order to test it properly, right? So the platform vendor is responsible for making sure the modules expose the hardware correctly and the plugins access it correctly. Um, the client applications themselves, the command line utilities and the daemons, um, are managed in the Sonic community. So we have unit tests for each of those applications for as much as we can. Uh, we have automated tests for as much as we can. That's a little more limited because, again, the, the platform hardware varies so much. Um, we have an automated test for LM sensors because that's a pretty standardized output and uh, we're able to to uh, determine whether or not LM sensors is collecting the data that it should. Um, but when it comes to automated testing, that's even more difficult within the community. Be again, we can't keep a copy of, a physical copy of every device. So if the platform vendor has um, implemented automated testing in their lab for their device, all the better, right? But um, however the vendor needs to test is up to them. So kind of a recap here and um, uh, just to describe the process again, to port Sonic to a new pl platform. So if you're, if you're a platform vendor and you want to port Sonic to your platform, um, for the platform management services, this is the, the three platform vendor responsibilities right here. Uh, the, the vendor needs to design the kernel modules, which simply expose the necessary registers to meet the Sonic requirements for interaction with the peripherals. Nothing more, nothing less. Very basic functionality. Expose things once and be done. Uh, the second step is to implement the platform-specific plugins which interact with that hardware. So that's um, a, little more, uh, a little more work, but both of these are still very straightforward and simple. And then the, all the logic is in the, in the client applications themselves, which the vendor shouldn't need to work with. The vendor just needs to uh, then test that these uh, kernel modules and, and um, plugins work as expected. And therefore, all the applications should also function properly at that point. So where are we at now? Um, this is the roadmap we have at, currently at the moment and a call for contribution to you in the community. Um, we still need to develop a few more remaining plugins. Um, we do not have a fan plugin currently. And um, um, we need to actually uh, get data from the system status registers to understand if a hardware issue caused the machine to reboot. Uh, we also need to uh, develop the command line utilities and, da and, uh, and the daemons, which are listed below, but the command line utilities to interact with both fans and system, system status registers still need to be developed. And uh, the daemons, uh, not only fans and system status registers, we also uh, need more, uh, more work on the transceiver daemon. It's, um, it's uh, in place right now, it's out there in the world. It could use some uh, some more work and just making it a, a better daemon, a better application all around. Uh, the PSU and fan daemons are yet to be developed, of course. 
fans. We don't even have the plugin yet. And then on top of that, we'd like the community also, if they'd like to help us develop tests, we're always always welcome to more and more tests. The more we can have you know, out there, the better, uh, the, the higher quality the software is in general if we have more tests. So uh, these are the open items. And um, if anyone is interested in working on some of this stuff, please feel free to talk to us and um, get a hold of us either here today or, or online. And uh, we'd love to have you help us out. Um, for further reading, this is the uh, link to the Sonic uh, platform porting guide that is in our wiki. So this goes more in detail about the actual plugins, the files that are um, that need to be modified, uh, things of that. The more nitty gritty is is there. And um, that's it for the presentation. And I will take questions. Yes, sir. Do you have a mic? Yeah, I do. Awesome. Uh, consumability of the data. You're generating a lot of data. Some of it should be near real time. Some cases I would like to hit particular threshold before I even notify someone. And in general, I would like to have schematic validation of what's going on. What are your plans to? So first of all, streaming. Obviously, if you do it too much too often, it will impact your uh, loads or whatnot. So. Right, so you're 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 asking how real time we can get this data? Is that is that what and, you're asking? And at what scale? I'm sorry. And at what scale? At what scale? Yes. Um, that's and that's really um, something that needs to be tuned, right? Um, it's it's hard to say. Obviously, yeah, it's going to be difficult to get real time data. We've we've um, we've incorporated the streaming telemetry, which I think will be discussed here later today. So you'll learn a little bit more about that. Um, and as you can see by the transceiver daemon there, that example, obviously the data is coming in uh, every time there's an interrupt event. Every time the transceiver is plugged or unplugged, we're getting real-time data immediately. Otherwise, we have that timed loop. And then that, that interval, right, that's to be determined, right? I mean, again, if you, you can't have that firing every millisecond, right? It's, um, it's, it's something that needs to be tuned, I think, on, on the platform itself. How about the pre-processing of the data? So if my temperature went up two degrees, probably I don't care. If it went up 40 degrees, probably I would. Would you allow to, to provide this kind of threshold framework? Threshold for actually receiving the data? Yeah. Like you wouldn't even care about the data until a certain point? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's meaningless if it's meaningless. That's right. Um, that's, uh, I'm not sure if our streaming telemetry has anything like that built into it. There will be more discussion of that later. But that's, that's, that's not really part of, uh, it's not incorporated into our, our daemons as of yet, right? The daemons themselves are, are more dumb to that. It's more of a, you know, do I need to give you data now? Uh, it's not, not, there's no logic involved on whether the data should be there. And that's something that could be discussed and we could incorporate that. That's, like I said, the transceiver daemon has been developed, but we'd like more work on it. Maybe you would like to contribute some some time of your own. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It probably more belongs into streaming telemetry session. But yeah. yeah, we definitely need to discuss some. There's a lot of work on open config side, on the EF side, so how you how you compare your operational state to your future state and what you do with it. Yes. Yes, sir. So regarding all these platform data, uh, are these uh, exported to the Uh The majority of this, yes. The majority. Um, uh, the, um, I believe we are, uh, Gohan, I don't know, do you, do you know, is the uh, optical data in SNMP? Is that, yes, we've got the optical data in SNMP. So the majority of this is in SNMP, and all of the above, you know, will be available through streaming tele telemetry as well. So the, so if I have like SFP util already running, uh, you, and then I can query my SNMP data. Uh, for your SFP for module? The SFP yes. Modules. Yes. Okay, awesome. Any other questions? We can take only one more. Yeah. Sure. Um, so it seems like there's quite a lot over the last between what you've described here and what the O and L group is doing. Why the different approach? What, what benefits do you see with this approach? Um, actually, I, I was just 
uh, talking with uh, some of the O&O guys uh, over lunch, and the approach is actually not much different, right? It's the abstraction. So the 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 again the kernel modules are left to the to the uh, the platform vendor the platform manufacturer that's what ONL is doing as well um, the, the the and the 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 pl- the plugins it's a, a similar thought to what they're doing on their side as well so um, we leave the hardware to the platform vendor because they know it the best right they they're focused on their hardware um, so the approach is actually very similar do you, uh, do you have an Uh, that's, that's true. Actually, that's yeah, so something we were talking about. Yeah. It's, uh, we're, we're kind of working in the, along the same lines right now. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that it? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Joe. All right. Thank you.